I'm very excited to open our, our 2016 summit with a panel on impact sourcing. To put this panel in context, and partly in recognition of the fact that for some of you this may be your first meeting and your first introduction to SBLC, I'd like to take a few moments to review why we've come together to create this big tent called the SBLC, what we collectively aim to achieve, and why it makes sense for us to open our 2016 summit with a conversation about impact sourcing. The founders of the council came together around an opportunity. The opportunity for institutional purchasers to use their economic influence as purchasers to advance a positive future by firmly embedding their values in their procurement processes. And this is a major opportunity. We estimate that institutional purchasing, by which we mean purchasing by governments and by business to consumer service providers, represents $10 trillion in spend in the US alone, and this is the largest concentrated, professionally managed driver of the U.S. economy. And we believe institutional purchasing is also the largest concentrated, professionally managed driver of the global economy as well. For leadership organizations and for the professionals who manage their purchasing, this represents a strategic opportunity, an opportunity to reduce risks and costs, an opportunity to improve supply chain performance, an opportunity to create value and secure competitive advantage, an opportunity to promote marketplace innovation, and in doing so, an opportunity to contribute to a sustainable future. But leadership organizations and the professionals that manage their purchasing currently face challenges in realizing this strategic opportunity. First, many leadership organizations have been going it alone, sending diverse, similar but different signals into the marketplace. Second, procurement and sustainability professionals lack access to consistent set of resources that could help them to navigate this landscape and encourage coordination. As a result, suppliers are faced with a barrage of similar but different market signals, what suppliers refer to as survey fatigue. The root challenge for purchasers and suppliers alike is lack of coordination in how leadership in sustainable purchasing is defined and practiced. The council came together around a blue sky question. Could we realize the opportunity for market transformation latent in institutional purchasing by collaborating to launch a shared program for guiding, benchmarking, and recognizing leadership in sustainable purchasing? We bring together a collaborative community to develop a consistent set of resources that enables all leadership organizations to send consistent market signals to advance sustainability and mission objectives. Each year, the summit is our opportunity to come together to advance that shared vision. And we use the summit as a moment to highlight emerging opportunities to realize that vision. Tonight, we're going to talk about a specific area of institutional procurement which represents such an opportunity. Business process services, or sometimes referred to as business process outsourcing, or BPO, which could include call centers, help desks, benefits administration, data entry, and more. Everyone in this room has business process services in their procurement. If you aren't doing business process outsourcing directly, perhaps because you're a public sector organization, you almost certainly are through services that accompany products that you buy, such as help desk and 24-7 phone support, data entry, and benefits administration. These services can make up sizable portions of many large contracts. So from the perspective of sustainable purchasing, it matters whether the lowest bidder is using a call center that provides living wage jobs in good working conditions with training and educational opportunities for its employees, or if the lowest bidder is the lowest bidder because they are using a call center where workers are given only five or 10 seconds between calls while working 10 hour days with few breaks for less than a living wage. So some questions for us to think about. As a purchaser, how do I know whether the business process services embedded in my procurement are reflective of my organization's values? How do I know whether there are hidden risks <coughs> associated with the business practices of the business process service providers whose services I am sourcing? How could I find out and how could I incentivize responsible practices? Today, we're going to hear from four leaders in the impact sourcing movement. Impact sourcing seeks to make the rapidly growing business process outsourcing industry, a powerful driver for sustainable economic development around the world and here at home. 
the Rockefeller Foundation as an organization, and Zia Khan as Vice President for Initiatives and Strategy have played an important role in identifying this emerging opportunity and supporting its development. We've asked Zia to share with us his perspective on this rapidly evolving conversation. After we hear from Zia, we'll ha hear a short video, and then I will host a panel discussion with Zia, two impact sourcing suppliers, and a buyer that is prioritizing impact sourcing. We will be working in our conversation to connect the work of the council, the work of all of you, that is supporting leadership organizations in exercising their values through procurement with the work of the impact sourcing community, which as we see it is developing a base of BPO suppliers whose practices align with the values of leadership organizations <coughs> that seek to procure their services. Ultimately, we will be looking to understand in practical terms how and in what context it could be appropriate for the council and its members to support impact sourcing. So with that, I would like to give the stage to Zia Khan. Yeah. Uh, thank you and good evening, everyone. I do want to talk about impact sourcing and why we at the Rockefeller Foundation find it so important. But first, maybe I'll, I'll tell you a little story. Before joining the Rockefeller Foundation, I used to work as a management consultant. And my very first project, when I was a new associate, was in a strategic sourcing project where we worked for a large telecom carrier. And this telecom carrier was trying to source temporary labor as an indirect category. So we did the usual, send out RFPs, get in price bids, make sure quality, met certain specs, try to negotiate the price down. But I was working with a client who was just incredibly passionate about making sure we met a third objective. And the third objective was to make sure that we worked with a supplier that had as an objective hiring women and minority-owned businesses. And he was just deliberate and you just wouldn't let go of that goal and made the point and we actually landed with one of the set of winners for the bids, a contractor who did focus on minority owned businesses and women owned businesses. And the way he explained it was that as a mobile phone carrier, they had retail stores that were open in communities. They would launch advertising to connect to their communities. And so what better way than to engage with communities than to bring back some of the spending and help catalyze the economic development of the community. Now this was over 15 years ago, and I really believe that he was ahead of his time. And it struck me as you know, amazing that someone would think about this, not as a CSR opportunity, but as part of the inherent long-term business objectives of this very important organization. Now, fast forward, I don't think that's news anymore. I don't think it's news that business has an important role to play in social development and economic development. And I think everyone here in the room would agree with that. What I hear is the big question is how to do this. What are the actual practices of how to do this? And this is where we get very excited about impact sourcing because we think it unlocks one of those rare answers and rare opportunities for how you can simultaneously pursue business objectives while also contributing to social and economic development. So at the Rockefeller Foundation, which is a 103-year-old institution, which is, I guess, just a kid compared to this university, uh, we have focused on improving the well-being of humankind uh, throughout the globe. That's been our mission for our entire history. And we have evolved in terms of we started off by helping catalyze the whole field of public health. We moved on to agriculture, helped launch the Green Revolution that fed a billion people. And we're now in a new era where we see the potential for market-based solutions to drive human progress and social progress. And so a lot of the work that we're doing is tapping into markets and identifying market failures and in the role that we can play as an institution in terms of our ability to convene government and private sector and communities and our ability to give some grant funding to help either contribute to necessary public goods or take some risks with some pilots and experiments we're trying to see how we can mobilize markets to realize these dual outcomes of business goals and also social objectives. One of our main goals as a foundation today is around inclusive economies. How can we help build inclusive economies, which in a nutshell boil down to more opportunities for more people, of which this university is a remarkable example. And what we've, as we scan sort of different opportunities, we did come across this idea that we now call impact sourcing, which is to recognize 
that so much of business is about creating jobs and so much of business is about procurement and directing that procurement towards different organizations, how could we be more intentional about that? So in leveraging the spend and leveraging opportunities in business process outsourcing or in hiring, how can we do so deliberately so that it creates social benefits and economic benefits? And we launched an initiative um, in 2013 called Digital Jobs Africa. And what we did there was we recognized there were these interesting, innovative entrepreneurs who were training people from slums and other disadvantaged communities in Africa where youth employment is an enormous problem and giving them access to jobs. So something like eBay, which might need a simple task like someone confirming that the description of an image actually matches the image or voice transcription or activities like that. They could, they could send that work to Africa in a deliberate way and provide that work to these disadvantaged communities so that young people wouldn't just get the income from it, which is of course beneficial, but more importantly, learn how to participate in the economy, learn how to show up to work, learn how to participate in a meeting, learn how to solve problems with their colleagues. And when I visited some of these locations in Nairobi, I was completely taken aback by how much change could happen so quickly. So I remember there was this one organization called Nairobits that would train people into how to use a certain software for tagging images. And I met a young woman, and she had been there for three years. She started the program. She was one of the first people in her family. In fact, she lived in a slum, one of the first people in her neighborhood to have a job, learned how to work, got excited about it. And because this digital work gave her feedback on how to get better, she very much rapidly progressed in the organization and launched her own business, then hired seven people to start her own business. And it was just wonderful to see how this notion, and, and I like the way Samosource, one of the organizations I'll be joining it, it calls it, in terms of giving work, could be so powerful as a catalyst. Mm -hmm. And it's not charity. It actually completely meets the business objectives of the organizations. So we're very excited about all the partners who we've been working with and that you'll be hearing from who have much more detailed experience and stories to share about what impact sourcing is, how it helps drive business goals, and how we can be more intentional with all the tools we have as business leaders. And I know that all of you are change leaders in some sense, otherwise you wouldn't be here. And so how can we help you in your organizations as you try and advance your personal agenda to get your organizations to do something differently? So with that, I just want to say thank you in advance for what I think will be a fascinating conversation with our panel. And I'll now hand it back over where I think we'll show a short video now. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks, um, thanks for the opportunity to show this video. We just thought that it'd be great to actually help uh, bring impact sourcing to life. So we're going to share a story about Martha. Martha is one of our former Sama Source workers. And we think hopefully through this video, you'll be able to see how transformational a first job can really be. In Kenya, it's really hard to find a job. The well-off people are the ones who get jobs. And us here, yeah, we have to struggle a lot. My mom abandoned me when I was still small. I went to live with my uncle at the slum, and it was a hard life. My uncle sometimes used to come home late, drunk. He starts abusing me, and the neighbors also are hearing, so it was really emotionally tormenting. It was a very hard life. But despite everything, I knew that challenges in life, they make us strong. My aunt passed. Then I had to seek help somewhere else. I was taken to St. Marian's Rescue Center. My time ran out at the Children's Center and I had to find a place to stay. I didn't have a job, and I also didn't have a place to go to. 
I didn't know what I was gonna do. Thomas was found me. Um, we went to the interview. Martha Kerubo, welcome. We are going to be working on a project for Samasus. We did the exams and then we were told, you go home, we'll give you a call. Most of the people who had done the interview were saying, that's not gonna happen. We've never been called. It's hard to believe when things aren't going the way you want them to go. Then after a few days, Samas has called me and said, um, we've passed, <laughs> and that was my happiest day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On my first day, I was feeling anxious. I woke up in the morning, putting on your official clothes, <laughs> and then I headed off to work. Uh, my biggest fear was basically everything. That feeling of you're going to a big office you've never been to before, you're going to work um, before the computer, and you've never done that before also. But I loved that feeling, I loved it. Well, there were moments I felt that, yeah, this thing is too, too good to be true. But it is true. <laughs> it's been my dream to just um, have my own place, paying for my rent, me buying my own food, be independent. Um, welcome to my room. This is where I keep my clothes, my stuff. And this is my bed over here. It's a little bit messy right now. I love my things tidy. Yeah. Thanks to Samasas, they found us the less fortunate. But they were my angels and they rescued me from the tough life that I had. And they gave me a better life. Yeah, sometimes I imagine my life. I don't know. If it, I wouldn't have gone this far. Yeah. I know that we had had some conversation about whether the video would really communicate how much had changed for Martha. If you saw Martha today, you would not even recognize her. Uh, she looks incredible. Um, we caught up with her uh, just about a year ago, so she stayed with us for roughly uh, three years. Before she moved on, she actually uh, did get promoted, and she eventually now is working in a Nairobi-based um, travel agency. But the thing that I wanted to highlight is that Pre, uh, you know, pre a local living wage, pre, pre Sama, she was eating sugar cane. That's a very common staple when you, know, you, you don't have any money, when you have less than $2 a day to live upon. Uh, no access to health care, and typically most people drop out of school because they can't afford to actually pay their school fees. So what happens when you can actually get that growth in income? And on average, we are increasing income by roughly about four times. So going from about $2 a day to a little over $8 a day after about three years, that means being able to pay for school fees and completing school, healthy food, grains and vegetables, safe living conditions, and access to medical care. Thank you for the opportunity to share the story. Oh, absolutely, thank you. So what I'd like to do to start off the panel is just to ask three newcomers to the stage to introduce yourselves, introduce your organization, and in a way, what impact sourcing means to you, how, you, how you've come to impact sourcing, what it means to you, and then we'll follow up after we've done that with maybe asking you to each share a, sto a specific story of an instance of impact sourcing that you've worked with. Tim, would you like to start? Thanks, Dave. Um, I'm Tim Opper. I work at Microsoft in our uh, purchasing uh, 
department driving the responsible sourcing for, for the company on our what we call our indirect suppliers, uh, non-manufacturing supply chain. Uh, I was introduced to impact sourcing about five, six years ago at a conference sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation. And um, it was fascinated by the concept. I sort of they didn't have the video, but the concept was there around how these organizations, uh, social entrepreneurs like Samasource, Digital Divide Data, were intentionally going to these markets to uh, empower people. And I, I thought that was an amazing concept that I ran across. Uh, and I went back to our portfolio at Microsoft and discovered we didn't have the uh, most of them. We had some of them already in our portfolio today. And so we actually were doing impact sourcing as a company just by engaging uh, the suppliers who are focused on this. Um, and that's how I discovered impact sourcing. I've spent the last four or five years trying to get more involved with it. Um, the Rockefeller Foundation was kind enough to sponsor through a grant uh, the work of a stakeholder group to better define and measure impact sourcing. Uh, we pulled uh, most of the impact source service providers, the social entrepreneurs together, uh, as well as some of our big BPO players, Southern Global Services was one of them, to come together and uh, define and, and put in metrics uh, around impact sourcing. So it was a, a stakeholder-led initiative uh, that we finished up last spring and now working with our companies to, um, to help manage uh, the measurements that we have today. So that's how I learned about impact sourcing. Uh, high level, how we view it at Microsoft is really it's around uh, two things. It's breaking down those artificial barriers. And in Martha's case, it was poverty. Uh, but most important also is uh, empowering that individual through, the, through their engagement. So uh, what we try to do in the, in the measurements is really capture those two things. What is the impact group and how are we empowering them? Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, my name is uh, Dan, and I'm an uh, executive with Sutherland Global. I'm actually one of the founders of the organization. I've been uh, with this outfit for 30 years now. Uh, we work from everyone from Airbnb and Amazon uh, to Microsoft uh, to Uber on the commercial side of the world. Uh, we also, uh, our largest government customer is Veterans Administration. We work for the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Cirque du Soleil. This is a wide portfolio of, of uh, customers. Uh, we have about 100 uh, customers uh, worldwide, and we generate uh, just over a billion dollars in uh, revenue. We compete with uh, the likes of the Accentures uh, of the world. Uh, they may think they're the New York Yankees. Uh, at least we're in you know, the MLB. Right? Um, <laughs> We are a privately held US-based uh, company, and uh, we, we operate a little bit differently. <clears throat> Make no mistake, we are a for-profit organization. But our CEO and founder uh, has a very different take on business and also impact on the community. Uh, we have two policies, very broad policies, uh, that are take a little get it, getting used to for executives that, that might join us. And that's that 100% of our customers have to be referenceable. Now, there's a lot of buyers out here from purchasing and procurement people who know about MPS and these, these net promoter scores and whatnot. We have a CEO who says there's no wiggle room, 100% customer referenceability. The other side of that coin is we need to impact one person or one family for every person who's employed by our company in the communities where we operate or around the globe. So 40,000 employees, you know, we're up to 35,000 families impacted who are not working for our company, okay? Uh, in various ways, be that uh, digi digital literacy programs, extreme mentoring uh, in, um, you know, unfortunate communities uh, where we might operate, various and sundry things. This is not corporate charity or donations. Uh, those are all great things, but this is where our company has to uh, impact that. Uh, we uh, discovered uh, the term impact sourcing, and uh, uh, we don't look at offshoring or outsourcing as impact sourcing. Impact sourcing uh, is a subset. It could be a subset of that. Uh, but to us, it means providing employment, but you're also providing some sort of social impact. And when people ask me about that, they say, what do you mean? And the story I'd like to share would be uh, Kingston, Jamaica. 
Uh, we set up operations there. Um, there. We wouldn't be the first company to find, you know, the island of Jamaica with great people and, you know, great employment wages. But we set up on a university campus. The government of Jamaica was no longer funding students uh, to go to school. So now they're faced with close to U.S. type uh, tuition bills for a private university or for a public university. Our job, every employee of ours has to be enrolled in school and vice versa, right? So if, you're, if you go to the school, uh, you have an opportunity of working for our company and it's a earn where you learn program. Coupled to that program, we operate in uh, Tivoli Garden in one of the worst garrisons in uh, Jamaica where we have a school where we've built a digital literacy center and we have an objective that of the people that we're training in the community, we have to hire 10% of them. Whether they're qualified or not, we will find 10% of our graduates of our digital literacy center a job. So we're, we're kind of working both ends of the spectrum. We're helping people get their university degree while providing services to companies, and we're also bringing up the next generation. Sort of a twist on the take a tree, plant a tree uh, concept. We're, we're uh, utilizing labor, and we're also creating that uh, next step. Thanks, Wendy. Hi again. Uh, so I'm Wendy Gonzalez, Managing Director of Salma Source. And we are an impact sourcing service pro services provider exclusively. And uh, what that means is that uh, we are actually a not-for-profit, so we are a, a 501c3. And how we initiate um, impact sourcing is that we work in communities where there's a high degree of underemployment. We provide digital training for them. And then we work with uh, large enterprises. And in some cases, uh, we do also have some uh, universities as an example that we work with as well to provide, to sell a project work that these workers can then go do. So our, our mission um, is really to not only train and provide the digital skills uh, and digital skills for resources, but to uh, basically, um, you know, permanently break the poverty cycle by providing them enough experience and a sustainable job with a living wage that allows them to move from unemployment to, to employment. Thanks, Wendy. So, Again, you kind of get a jump start on the story. I'd like to hear stories also from Tim and from Wendy's, just kind of a, and as really as lengthy or as detailed as you like, to help give us a feel for what it means to do impact sourcing. That is what it means for someone who's sourcing business process services to make this choice and take us to a place, take us to an actual instance of doing that. Uh, I think for me, I'll, I'll cite maybe two examples. Um, probably my first one was at, at one of Dan's centers actually in Chennai, India. Uh, about eight years ago, Dan's company started this outreach to the community to train uh, individuals as a community outreach. And I, they, we, we passed a, a, a milestone of 1,000 people trained. And so I, I went there just to go to a, a ceremony. And um, one of the individuals came forward um, during, at the end of the ceremony. Um, he didn't speak any English. And so as an interpreter, and he, was a, he came up and it was this just kid, and he just gave me a hug and he was crying, he said, thank you. Um, and I didn't know what was going on, and it turned out he was from a neighboring slum. This is his first time to go through this outreach program that Dan had. Um, and it was you know, just one of those concrete expressions, like, oh, this, is, this is real, this is, um, this is really happening. And then um, you know, subsequently, I think uh, two years ago, um, I heard that he's now in robotics training mm -hmm. Uh, school at a university uh, pursuing a, ro a robotics degree. Um, so going from a slum in India up to, a, to the university was uh, all the work of Sublim and what, and what they did. So it was a very concrete um, feeling of what, of what impact looks like. I've also had a chance to visit some of the other impact service, service providers and just witness, and I think that's part of what I think Rockefeller saw with this, is this is transformational. These, these, this does affect uh, individuals uh, for the better. And so those experiences sort of galvanized me. I know there's, it's a newer notion, um, but for me it's, a, it's one of those transformational ideas from a supply chain where historically we've been looking just more defensively and how to, uh, companies to make sure they're protecting human rights and, and all those things are really important. But I think what these companies are showing me or sh showed me is it's not just a defensive posture that we want to look for. We want to look at companies that actually are 
actively empowering the individuals. Um, so it's that, it's that transformational change that I sense how we should engage communities going forward, and I think these companies are leading the way. I, I want to add to what Tim said, uh, just so that everyone is clear. Um, at least in our case, we did not set out, you know, to say, let's go do this mission, and uh, hey, that fits with what Microsoft is looking for. Uh, very important point, and we're starting to see this trend uh, with other multinationals. You know, governments aren't very efficient, right? Some large NGOs aren't very efficient. But suppliers, they're economically driven, are very efficient machines, right? You know, to, to, in order to, make, in order to make, their, make their profit. The power of the contract and suggesting these ideas and looking for these things, that's driving the ecosystem. We could not sus sustain. Even internally in my own company, people say, why are we doing all this, right? Why are we doing all this? If we want to cut expense, we can cut expense and get rid of this thing or that thing. It might be a social investment or you know, some other, other program. But the contract and the qualifications are what makes that work. And it starts to spread. So I mean, just a, a tip for folks in the audience, you can, you can impact this with looking for these things inside the suppliers. It's nothing we got into to differentiate ourselves in the market. It was suggested, we started doing it, now it's become prerequisite. Whether it's a green initiative, whether it's a social initiative, education, whatever, you have a lot of power to write that into your contract. Wendy, I want to ask you to share a story as well. Just Sure. So yeah, we're coming at it from, from a, a slightly different angle in that we started as a mission-based organization. Um, I will say, though, that um, I very, very much agree with what Dan is saying. And what, how we started and how we thought we could actually make it and make an impact was that we wanted to be a sustainable organization. It only works if there's a market driver, if there's actually demand. So we started with a fundamental, pre uh, fundamental premise that Talent is, talent is distributed equally, um, but opportunities are not. So how can we go and remove those barriers to opportunity? So we've, we've learned a lot in the, the last seven or eight years. Um, first, it's pretty hard. <laughs> it's actually pretty hard work. We spent a lot of time on the ground working with local communities. And we had to say to us, you know, what does impact mean for us? Much like uh, Tim had said. Well, what it meant for us was poverty alleviation. So we would work in uh, specific local communities, whether it was Nairobi, uh, Gula, Uganda, or Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and we would say, what is the local living wage? And so our purpose was to find people, the people who qualified to be impact workers are those that are living well below local living wage. So in the case of an area like Kenya or Nairobi, that's less than $3.30 a day, and we purposely went out to find people in communities where we knew they were making less than $2 a day. From there, we also learned that uh, if we're going to measure our outcomes, how do we know if we're actually making an impact? It was really related to the empowerment component. So we made it our focus to try to improve wages um, and barriers to sustainable employment as our primary focus. So that's led to um, a huge amount of learnings, uh, not only providing a, a, a living wage, which is interesting because you got to be super hyper efficient, uh, as Dan mentioned, to be competitive and provide a great service. But then secondly, a lot of other things that we know contribute to um, sustainable employment. And that's everything from transportation when you're living in Islam, to subsidized meals, to child care, um, and uh, to basic training, which is things like we've never had you know, a, a banking account. So what do I actually do? What is the financial literacy? So well beyond the digital training, there's a whole host of other um, skills that we're looking to provide. And um, that's, that's pretty much how we define impact sourcing. So in, all, in most of the cases that you've described, you're talking about, in your case at least, Tim, you're talking about a, a company, Microsoft, that's sourcing services and using providers who are in other parts of the world. Um, curious about, and Zia, you might want to weigh in on this as well, the kind of international versus domestic context of impact sourcing and how our members, many of our members are public, public sector purchasers. They, are deeply engaged in their local or regional economies and how they might think of this, how may, they might think about impact sourcing and it might be a challenge for them to be thinking about how would I think about sourcing from a provider who's on the other side of the world when I have a deep commitment to my local or regional economy. Can you just 
talk us through how you think about the extent to which that's an accurate perception of impact sourcing, that it's international sourcing, and also how our audience might be thinking about that. Well, maybe I can, I can Please. start with a little bit uh, of comments. So this is something that's been on our minds uh, since we first started to get engaged in this work, um, 2008, 2009, that time frame. And I guess our perspective is that what impact sourcing is really about is trying to harness market forces as opposed to trying to steer them in a certain direction. So if your business strategy is to lower the cost of labor and you are looking internationally outside of the United States, then you might as well do it in a way that has the maximum social impact for the same cost than not. And so that's one lens to think about impact sourcing. But there's also a broader way to think about impact sourcing about what you do inside this country. And I know Samosource has started to look inside the US. We do a lot of work on US youth employment of how companies can align their business strategies of accelerating hiring or lowering attrition rates by tapping into disadvantaged uh, youth communities that wouldn't otherwise have the certifications of a four-year college or things like that that aren't so relevant to the job but they can meaningfully contribute to companies. So I, I guess I mean, that is a concern. It certainly does come up. Are we sending American jobs uh, um, you know, outside the US? But our, our perspective is that it's happening. It's a global economy. People are working across borders. So if you do, and if that's part of your strategy, this is a way to realize more impact than how you might otherwise. And I would just jump on that. I think that's right. I think Microsoft is a global company, and so we operate in like 150 some odd countries. And so for us, I mean, the majority of our spend is on the shore of the country on which it's originated. Um, but it, 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 what we view in sourcing, it really is, it's that broad definition of the artificial barrier and empowerment. Some of the best examples we have are locally, even in Seattle, um, on our real estate facilities. We hire intentionally, working with a, a lot of NGOs, people with physical disabilities, to work across our campus. Uh, we work on a Native American tribe locally to do some BPO work, uh, Kyos Technologies, which is one of the impact source service providers um, I wanted to head in my portfolio early on. So there's a lot of great local um, manifestations of how this looks, depending on where you're at. It's just looking for what those opportunities are locally and then trying to build the model around that. And I just want to underline, because you've referenced a couple times, Tim, an implicit definition that you're using, which is the, the maybe you want to restate it for me, but. Ar artificial barriers, I mean, we aren't a charity either. These have to be capable workers that can do the job. So it's knocking down whatever those artificial barriers are for that particular employee, that capable employee, and ensuring you're not exploiting them, but you're empowering them and making them successful. So some real examples we also have in our portfolios, uh, autistic workers, great programmers, great skills. Art there's an artificial barrier of, of the workplace conditions. We've got to get, knock those down and then engage those, those employees. And so. That's how we view impact sourcing, and that's um, part of what we try to develop with the metrics work. Uh -huh. and, and we I, use a, that very kind of a simple definition. And I actually attended the first Rockefeller uh, conclave on this uh, subject. First uh, model we put forth was Detroit, and and when we were everyone was talking about Africa uh, and uh, 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 the Middle East at that time about employment. Um, impact sourcing can be done right here. In my own community, Rochester, New York, we only graduate 40% of the students in the urban community. All right, that's it. That's worse, top five, worst graduation rate. Nobody's hiring anyone with a criminal background, violent crime or not. You're not going to get a job. You don't have a high school degree. Where do you go? And that you know, that's probably the next frontier for a lot of sourcing companies is urban and rural sourcing. And just to jump on that, I think the context here helps um, the, the college, right? The, the, the unemployment rate for people with hearing disabilities is 75%, so it blows away some of the stat statistics you see in developing worlds. Um, that's another opportunity for domestic impact sourcing. Um, and so that's also, we built in those type of things into how the stakeholders are thinking about how this can work. Um, but yeah, I think the opportunities are, are all over the place. When did you have anything to add on the kind of definition of? Um, well, I, I completely agree with that, and I agree it absolutely can happen here in the U.S. Uh, as well. We have programs, um, programs here as well. Uh, ours are a little bit more focused on how can you retool and sort of provide 21st century uh, digital skills to people who might not have those skills. 
but um, absolutely, working in the uh, the Delta of Arkansas, it's honestly we just delivered a one of our first projects over there, and the similarity is to working in a slum in Nairobi. There are a lot it's of no them. different. They're really not any different, so um, it absolutely can be done here domestically as well. So I have I have a question for you, Tim, but I want to extend it to the rest of the panel, and it pertains very much to what this community that we are building could do for those in our audience who hear about impact tourism and think this sounds great. I like, I like the sound of this. I, I'm interested. I'm a major purchaser. Maybe I'm a public sector purchaser. What are the ways that you see that purchasers who are members of this council could be engaging in impact sourcing, encouraging impact sourcing, incentivizing the presence of impact sourcing within either directly, or directly sourcing or indirectly within their procurement? I think at least two opportunities. One would be to engage directly to an impact sourcing, right? To build potentially a tag group or some kind of uh, momentum where we start to take what the work that's been done and catalyze that and move, move forward. So direct involvement would be ideal. Um, but second to that, one of the things that actually helps me do impact sourcing is the stakeholders from the public sector. So uh, especially some of the best contracts I have from RFPs is where the public sector sector customers are asking me if I engage, um, for example, social enterprises like Samosource. And so I can actually use impact sourcing as, yes, I am doing that and cite that as an example. And so at that high level, that helps. Um, but even more uh, prescriptive, do you do impact sourcing could uh, potentially help motivate the, the private sector to do more of this. And I don't want to, we agreed before we started this panel, we weren't going to get into the weeds of defining what impact sourcing is and isn't. But I think one of the challenges that our community has faced is the challenge of definitions in procurement. That is, if you're going to put a requirement for impact sourcing into your contract, you're going to need to have some kind of definition of what that means and be able to substantiate it. And, you're, and I'd be curious how you would help our audience, how you would each help our audience think about that and characterize the current state of where we are with respect to a shared definition of impact sourcing where we might be in the future, um, how this audience might be responding to current state, where there might be not be perfect agreement on the definition, but also how this audience might be contributing toward a future in which there is a, a better definition where when the phrase impact sourcing goes into a contract, mm -hmm. everybody knows what it means and there isn't so much ambiguity around it. So I guess, um you know, something that we've been doing in terms of the role of the Rockefeller Foundation is to try and help create the public goods and catalyze the market here. So I think our lens on it has been, um, it's not so important to come up maybe with the definition as much as it is to come up with a language. And so that's where some of the work that we've been doing and Tim and others have been helping lead is defining the metrics for impact sourcing. So at least that way we can start to create the market between procurers who want certain dimensions of impact sourcing or certain elements of social impact are important to them, they can put those metrics into the contract. And that helps send a signal to the folks like Wendy at Samosource and other providers that this is actually something that's important. There actually is demand for this. And so I think a really important function of these metrics is to send a signal that this is actually something that's important. And once we start to see that signal, I think we'll see more innovators or more people starting to scale up, get more efficient, and grow, because they know that the demand is there. And that has actually been one of the fundamental chicken or egg problems that we've been wrestling with over a number of years that we've tried to help with in terms of funding research on what the business case is, putting convenings together so people can talk about this. But this role of metrics that help give a language so people can talk about and understand each other, what they mean by impact sourcing, for us right now is probably the more important problem to solve than landing on a singular definition. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's a question of certification and verification, which gets at a definition. But that's what we're really excited about seeing happen now. I think it's pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, uh, and again, I'm not in the buying position, but uh, it's, it's a uh, you know, trust and validate thing. This categorization of clicking a box of are you minority owned, are you, are you doing impact sourcing, uh, that's all definition stuff. And um, it's hard to, uh, uh, to measure. But it's, uh, it's, almost in the it's almost in the name. What impact are you creating? 
right? And if you can, if you can quantify that. I run around my company whenever anybody talks about from a donation to a, a volunteer program. How many lives have we impacted? Before we even have the conversation, how many lives are going to be impacted by that? Whether it's $5,000 to a donation or we're going to go work on this. So, you know, what's the impact at the end? And if you could write that into your specification, it'll almost self-govern itself. And, you know, make your judgment. Hey, this, this thing we're going to do, in addition to providing us work, it's going to create this impact whether it's social impact, environmental impact, whatever. What is the intended impact? I think it's simple. The only thing I would jump on, I think, I, um, yeah, I, I love what was just said. With the, the state of the metrics, I think where they're at, I think that the analogy that I shared earlier, it's much like GRI reporting. If you're doing that, there's a set of metrics that is standardized and allows, um, I think, to your earlier presentation, Jason, those market signals. If we all align on sort of similar taxonomy as far as what we're driving for, and we all agree that that's right, I think that sends the right proper consistent signals so suppliers aren't randomized. Um, but it is, I mean, we continue to need to iterate. These are, these are our first step at, at defining what, the, uh, what impact source is and how we measure it. Uh, we need to continue to iterate um, and improve what those definitions are, and then ultimately set thresholds. Right now, it's not, uh, the way that it's at today, it's, it's disclosing, it doesn't actually have uh, what the right standards are as far as what constitutes an impact sourcer. And that's, I think, something that, again, purchasers can actually lead the discussion and decide what those thresholds should be. Great, thank you. I want to take this opportunity to see if we have any questions from the audience for the panelists before I wrap up with a final question. Looks like we do. Do we, do we have a roving mic by any chance? Yeah. Thanks, Sam. Sorry. I see a question here and then in the back. I think for. Up, up. <laughs> okay, we have, looks like we have one, we need to do one, two, three, four. Who is one? Saying one, one, then I see a hand in the back. Thank you very much. Um, it was very, very interesting, and um, I'm not necessarily disagreeing uh, with the, any of the presentations and, and discussions uh, uh, had here, but I, let me play a role of devil's advocate uh, for the time being. Uh, that's what uh, academics do. By the, by the way, my name is Sang Wan Su. I'm a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and also president of Vital Metrics. What we do is measuring the uh, social, environmental, and economic impacts. Um, so recently, we just published an article about the, um, the impact of sourcing. Um, the, the particular uh, measurement that we did was um, the impact of uh, sourcing on in increasing greenhouse gas emissions and decisions made by the high-income countries to source their inputs from low-income countries. I definitely agree that, well, in terms of the social impact, there is a higher bang for the buck to be spent in low-income countries. In terms of inequality, of uh, social opportunities, income inequality, it's definitely there is a higher impact, positive impact to be spent in uh, low-income countries. What we found, though, is that, well, there is also higher uh, environmental costs associated with the dollars spent in low-income countries, mm -hmm. primarily because of the fact that the um, electricity grid mix and an energy infrastructure in those countries are much dirtier as mm -hmm. compared to the ones that are in the uh, um, developed countries, high-income countries. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that, well, impact sourcing and sourcing to uh, developing countries is bad or, or, you know, good or bad. It's black and white. What I would like to uh, highlight is that there is a trade-off. Um, is the income inequality, uh, you know, global imperative? Yes. Is climate change global imperative? Yes. Um, there is a trade-off when we are making those sourcing decisions, um, and I think those are the things that we also have to pay attention to. Thank you. I, I would actually like maybe just to make one one comment is I mean I, I think that's I, I mean I, I think you're right those are those are multiple considerations and this is a relatively nascent area so it's a couple of different factors of selection but as an example we have a center out in Gulu Uganda that is powered um, completely by solar panels so you know there there are ways in which you know ideally you can sort of double your impact, if you will, or sort of triple bottom line. And I, I think that's something that we should all strive towards. Um, and, you know, it, it, it is possible. There, there wouldn't be folks, uh, you know, working in uh, northern Uganda otherwise. And this, I think that's what I heard, Dan, in your suggestion of a way that you were understanding 
impact sourcing within your own company that is looking at, so what is the impact? Mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing you, Wendy, say is, well, it needn't be only one that you might be looking to optimize and that the kinds of conversations yeah. we have here would be conversations of optimization. Sangwon, thank you for the question. There was a question in the back, I can't see. Yeah. Yeah, first off, uh, Josh Jacobs, uh, chairman of ISO 20,400 U.S. Mirror Committee. Um, first off, congratulations to all of you, and thank you for showing us a way. Um, really quickly, I guess my question is, have any of you utilized or, or looked at ISO 26,000? Uh, that'll be my first question, because in talking about definitions, ISO 26,000 defines social responsibility 135 countries agreed to it. The U.S. was the only one that did not. Um, we voted no, shockingly enough, um, because it said ISO in front of it. Um, but um, it, it defines a lot of what you're talking about. And remember, when they talk social responsibility outside of the United States, they're talking triple bottom line. They don't. It's very socially focused on what we're talking about today. But look at ISO 26000, please. And also, thank you for teeing up ISO 20400 at 135 tomorrow after lunch. <laughs> because the <laughs> metrics about defining for yourself and measuring, come, come listen to us. We have a standard coming in 2017 that'll help you do just that. So I'd, I would like to hear from the panel if, if they've looked at ISO 26000 or work with it or understand it or are utilizing it. Thank you. I, I have not, but it's an excellent idea. In fact, uh, we, were, we were way back in the early 90s, just to be cute, we applied for ISO 9000. We don't have a design or any th function. I said, how hard can this be? But at least we wanted to get into it. Um, I did not know that they had a social responsibility definition, and I will bring that one back to my company for sure. And I will attend your session. <laughs> Tim, so, that so, might be very popular. Tim. So quickly on ISO 26000, it's a great standard, or not standard, uh, guidance for uh, uh, social, it's not, a real, not really a standard, but a great guidance. Um, we thought the best in class as far as social uh, impact was SA 8000. Um, actually, the SAI, Social Accountability International, served on the stakeholder group who developed the metrics. The metrics are really about, you know, the, the very specific around Im impact employment, and it goes much deeper than what you, you typically see, and that was the need that was, that was sponsored by, by Rockefeller. I do want to circle back to the previous question, because I think that was great. There's always trade-offs, and be mindful of what those are. Um, we do have, you know, we have many suppliers. There's a set of suppliers that, if we're thinking of uh, the contact center space, we do require them to uh, report on their, their, their climate change impact. And so they, they're all disclosing and setting targets uh, through the CDP, and that's a requirement. So we try to balance it that way. Um, we don't do that with some of the, the small, smaller impact source social enterprises. We think that just like why we didn't go with SA 8000, there's, there's requirements that are sort of at the right level for the right size company. Um, but it's a great, great point. And that, that environmental uh, uh, item, uh, that's a byproduct. I mean, we were only doing this social thing. And, you know, when Tim, it, 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 start, it started to snowball. We now track all those things, and we never did before, right? We didn't know anything about that side of social or of sustainability. And now that's part of the program. So, that, you know, it spurred that side. But we've never compared the two. But again, we're a supplier, so I'm not sure. So I've seen another, a number of hands up. Uh, but one thing I'd like to do is see if there are hands up from anybody who's in procurement who might be purchasing services. Nope. There we are. Oh, sorry. Um, hi, my name is Makran Booth, and um, I am an uh, uh, architectural engineering consultant, and uh, we are doing projects in the uh, United States, uh, India, and China. Um, Rockefeller 100 Resilient Cities, uh, Bloomberg and Prime Minister of Modi, India, uh, 100 Smart Cities, um, Nobel Stockholm, you know, uh, Biodiversities or Clinton Foundation's uh, Climate Change C40 Cities. Um, so we are advisors for uh, two smart cities in central India. And um, so we are specifying a lot of these things, and besides that, um, I am in several working groups at the United Nations uh, 
habitat, which is setting up the global agenda on urbanization and environment. Um, so I have a very simple question. Um, when we are looking at very rapidly creating these cities, you know, it took us 200 years, 2,000 years to build the cities and civilizations, but what we see in China, in 20 years we have, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of cities and uh, uh, brick countries, you know, developing nations are setting this space to build hundreds of cities in a very fast pace and some of the people, uh, some of the great people who are here in the panel, uh, some of the organizations uh, you are with, they are right behind these cities to develop sustainability. Uh, quickly, my question is, in terms of impact sourcing, uh, how do you engage the informal sector, informal economies, which is the 70% uh, of the economies, and sourcing because, you know, the manufacturing and a uh, uh, lot of the services they are providing, the informal economies? If I can maybe Wendy take might, a first yeah. stab at this. So one of the things uh, that, <coughs> that uh, we were focused on was exactly, was exactly that. And the way that uh, we, chose to, we chose to address it was through the gig economy, the sharing economy. So uh, as an example, we developed um, training classes, basically digital training, to teach people how to get into that informal, to get into the, the gig economy or the sharing economy. So if you are talking about, um, for example, a company like uh, TaskRabbit, as an example, what it does is an informal, you know, it's a sharing economy marketplace where uh, where people do local jobs in that particular area. So it could be carpentry, it could be taxi cab drive, it could be anything. Um, but the people who are in those areas may not actually know how to get onto that marketplace. So we would provide training to say this is how you go, create a profile, how you can, you know, start to get reviews so that you can actually enable yourself to do those jobs. Um, we also work globally, for example, with Upwork. Um, they, you don't have to do, it's also the sharing economy, um, but it's, it's doing digital work that may not be in your specific locale. And we would work to provide training for in-demand skill sets to enable, again, people who've got the talent and the skills, may, you know, may not be digital, uh, or in that case it's digital, but in the case of, um, of a task rabbit, it could be anything. Um, but those folks just don't know how to get into, the, into that space. So um, that's one way in which we've tried to address it. I'll just add a brief comment. You know, cities are an interesting lens to look at this. Cities are very dynamic. They're providing lots of economic opportunity. Not everyone is able to share in it. And so far, a lot of what we've talked about is about the benefit to the individuals. But you touched on this point, which is in India, they did a study that you know, in some of these communities, if someone has a job, it positively affects five other people. Their you know, family, what they are spending money on in their local communities. So the notion of cities as being these dense groups of communities and how entire communities can be excluded. But if we can reach into those communities, it can have disproportionate effect because all of a sudden you have role models. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you're rewiring what the networks look like in a city. And so you start to have even more catalytic change happen if you can do this in some of these dense areas. Thanks. Got a question here, Farid? Thank you, Jason. Yeah, I would like to. I'm Farid Yecker from UNEP, United Nations Environment Program. I'd like to congratulate you for uh, the choice of the subject. I think it's very important. It's not only a good idea, but I think it's a necessity. You know, we have to share our prosperity. We're going to have 9.5 billion people in 2050, many of them in the South, many in, in poor countries. And uh, we're seeing, you know, the social problems where I come from Europe, I come from Paris, and we see the problems of migration. You know, people are going to come more and more because they want to participate in the global economy. And they want to have uh, their share of our prosperity. So you have what you're doing, you know, is something that is going to be more and more the case, more and more a usual practice because we have to do it. Right now, in, we almost had, uh, in Europe, uh, we had an election in Austria. We have a rise in uh, populist parties, not just in Europe, it's happening also somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there is a reason for that, you know. Because we're, uh, you know, people feel threatened. And we, if we don't offer jobs in Europe, it's going to be much more difficult to offer jobs in our countries. We have to go in these countries. That's why it was really interesting to see 
that you're working in developing countries. So don't be ashamed that you're helping create jobs uh, abroad because you're helping yourself also you know, in your countries because we will have to share prosperity in the future. And that's the first point. 40% unemployment rate in Kenya is not possible. People are ready to die right now and they're dying in the Mediterranean just because they want to get jobs. You know, they're dying also in France trying to cross the channel because they want to have jobs. That's the, the first point. So that's why in UNEP we say, and in 2012 in, in Rio, we advocated the principle, the, the, the concept of uh, green economy, but we added inclusive green economy because we have to make sure that everyone participates in the economy. So when you said environment is important, I mean, it's, a, it's an issue. That's why we have to balance environment and social. It's really important. Uh, second point, I think what is great is the, that you highlight the power of purchasing. And this is something, I mean, decision makers have to listen to and really understand, that we have a tremendous potential there. Uh, I, before I used to work for an NGO, and I came up with my uh, colleagues with the concept of uh, uh, corporate responsibility for development, not just for uh, social responsibility, but mm -hmm. for development. When we had people like uh, companies like uh, Accor, they were operating in Senegal, they were bringing all their inputs and their uh, supplies from the north, from France, and we were telling them, you know, if you buy uh, waste bins, you have handicraft here, and if you buy from uh, the local economy, then you're going to support also uh, people. And, bring people into uh, the jobs, into the economy. So, you know, there's a thinking that we have to also, uh, you know, get across and, 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 and make those people understand that there is a tremendous potential and with cooperation funds that are really becoming scarce, I mean, the potential is far by far much bigger than cooperation funds, what cooperation funds can offer. And if we leverage cooperation funds with uh, the impact, social impact we can create, and sourcing, impact sourcing, then we can have even further results and much pro bigger results. Thank you. Thank you, Fareed. We had one, one last time for one last question. If you could pass the mic down. Thanks very much. Um, my name's Barbara Bramble. I'm chair of the board of the uh, Roundtable on Sustainable Biomaterials, and I'll be meeting many of you uh, during the next couple of days. <clears throat> Just wanted to thank you, all the organizers, for brilliant and inspiring panel. Um, everybody, I'm sure, has reacted in the same way. This is so important. And particularly, I love the exchange where we heard that, yes, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can look at the social impact and ask about the environmental impact while we're at it. But we just have to think about it, right? It has to be intentional. But my question is just a short practical one. How many firms are there like you guys, and where are they to be found for companies here who would like to actually start doing this? Some sense of scale. Thanks. Sure. So, um, actual dedicated impact service, service, service providers, I think the Rockefeller Foundation did a, a survey. I think there's only about 15 or so, if I look. And that's the one that's formally that have gone through the process and share their capabilities. And there's a brochure we can get as far as those companies. What we, and those companies are doing great, as I said, they're, they're kind of on the leading edge showing, I think, a new paradigm. Um, but part of what we're trying to do is bring not more traditional companies um, into this. And so today at Microsoft, we've got about uh, 10 traditional uh, for-profit companies um, that are now doing impact sourcing, um, following the same model and learning from the impact source service providers. All right, one last question. <laughs> Please, if you could wait for the microphone. <coughs> Try again. Okay. Yeah. My name is Thomas Witt. I'm from Code Earth, and I'm from Germany. And I uh, have worked with a number of nonprofits, and I'm actually at the moment advising technology without borders is a German nonprofit working in developing countries in Africa in Middle America and in Asia and uh, one important question is I heard that you are engaging with the communities by providing services like education and so forth but is it as well that they are community driven uh, projects so where communities come to you and ask you if you can help them on particular problems because that's the most important thing 
to have a sustainable um, program, a sustainable project that actually is uh, bought in by the community. If they, if they can get fulfilled uh, a service or any help that they want, because if you come there and say, well, we have a nice thing we would do with you, and you can do, I don't know, the, the, the houses could be all in green, and you paint them in green, then they have nothing from that, and they never buy in that. And there's a very a nice, um, it's a TED movie that you can look at. I'm promoting him all the time, I'm but it's an with you. Ernesto, a quick question. A quick Ernesto Ciroli, uh, shut up and listen, and he's talking about um, the topic of um, de sustainable development and help in Africa. So, uh, so the question. I'll just, yeah, I'll just comment on, on the one is that um, it, it's, a, it's a combination of uh, community partners reaching out to us or, or, or governments as well saying, hey, we could use jobs in this area, but, you know, this is a particular economically depressed area. And so that is a lot of times how we connect. I mean, I wouldn't have guessed uh, that three years ago we would work in Dumas, Arkansas. Um, but it turned out that not only is there an extremely high poverty rate, one in four, but they also had a community who was really interested in engaging and saying, you know what, we want to dedicate resources to this too. So why don't you come and work with our facility? We'll find an internet services provider and let's come, let's come together. We also found that, um, for example, New York. So we work with the Robin Hood Foundation up in, in New York and that's a very urban area. So what we found in urban areas, the concept of the gig or sharing economy related to development, we were talking about, you know, whether it's you know, masonry or construction, we found that works pretty well in those uh, urban areas. Where we found to be a little bit more challenging is when you're in a rural area, like Dumas, Arkansas, you probably don't have a lot of task rabbit jobs just because there isn't a great demand. So we've sort of switched our gears a little bit on that approach and tried to bring digital work to Arkansas, much like we would bring digital work to Kampala, Uganda. So that's, uh, that's what we've seen so far. Other comments on that question? Dan, I would just say, um, I know from the work with Southern, I mentioned the Chennai um, experience, when we were tracking those metrics first up, there was about 120 plus NGOs that were involved with that work. And so the NGO involvement, I mean, Dan's just opened up the doors to a call center in the middle of India saying anybody that wants to have free digital literacy training, they'll pay for the training. Um, they had <laughs> they had 1,000 people trained right out, right out of the gate, and it was through the work of the community NGOs involved with that work. And I'd say it, it, it's both ways. I mean, there's some cases where uh, our company, you know, has reached out to a community to do something that is 100% in our control. And there's other examples where, especially domestically, where people have come to us and said, we have this situation. Uh, veterans came, came to us and said, you know, we've got this, this issue. Can you help us find employment uh, for these guys? Total other example, other side of the world, we have a Middle Eastern telecom company who said we need to figure out how to employ Saudi women in the home. How, how can you help us with this? You know, so two, two different examples, but you know, cases where the community came our way. So some but not all of our panelists will be with us for the full conference, and you'll have a chance to speak with them, but I want to give them each an opportunity for just some closing comments. And if you so choose, you can also Give us a window into where you see impact sourcing headed in the future, but that's up to you. But I'd just like to hear some closing comments from each of you. Sure, thank you. So first, I just want to thank all my co-panelists whose work is so inspirational, and we're just fortunate to be able to play a role in supporting it as well in this market of impact sourcing. And unfortunately, I won't be here for the rest of the conference, but my colleagues, Elena and um, uh, uh, John, will be here at a table and we're more than happy to share all the information we've learned in terms of specific case studies, specific business value propositions, and all the research that we've done as well. Um, so more to come. Um, and it's been interesting to hear some of the comments from the audience in that we believe there is a big global role for this. There are big global forces at work. Um, but I think what's the exciting question is what individual companies can do as a practice. And in terms of where I see impact sourcing going, I hope it just becomes a standard practice of how to do business, that it will just automatically make sense. And I think the transition we are seeing is we have lots of early adopters and leaders and champions, and now we need to make the leap to an early majority and how do we almost institutionalize this and make it business as usual and make it very strange to think about procurement without thinking about the kind of social impact and have that be a missed opportunity, rather a trade-off or a tax. I'd only add that uh, in the last decade since you know, we've been getting serious about this 
you know, corporate responsibility in, in general. Oh, weird things happened on the way to the bank, right? 10% uh, of our workforce has decided, I shouldn't say they decided, their our retention rates are higher with, with employees. And there are people who stay at our company when they could work somewhere else because they get to be involved with this, which is a, a weird byproduct we never thought about. That's a great point. Uh, as far as where the future is going, uh, absolutely um, gender equality in women in the workforce, globally here, Europe, all developing markets, completely under leveraged. And I see that that's probably going to be uh, the biggest thing in the next couple of years, as well as uh, domestic impact. I would agree with both. My hope is that this is just how business is done, that we are all enlightened and know that this is how the world should be engaged and can demonstrate it like uh, these suppliers have gone out and done. They're doing the hard work of actually going to the communities and making this impact, and I think it's, uh, it's their work that, that I get to enjoy. And I want to thank also the Rockefeller Foundation. I, I, they introduced this to me. Um, you know, I'm in a boring purchasing department. I'm not sure anybody can feel, uh, uh, feel what I go through each day, but actually to plan a vision of how people in procurement can actually ra have this uh, radical change at their fingertips. And so thanks for it. People don't listen to me when I say it, but when I can put the Rockefeller brand around, they're like, oh, OK, this, this could make sense. <laughs> so, so thank you for that. And then the SBLC for actually hosting this conversation and, and um, supporting this all around. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tim. Wendy. So I, it's nearly all been said, I guess, uh, aside from the, uh, the thanks and, and repeating what was just said. I would just say that sustainable purchasing is good purchasing. Um, you can get the same quality, you can get the same cost effectiveness, and the employee engagement is huge. So a lot of times we want our work not necessarily because we come in through the CSR channel where somebody says this is, you know, sounds like a great thing. It's, it's not a charity. It's actually the way that business can and should be done, sourcing responsibly. And uh, there are many, many studies, including one that I came, think just came out in 2014 from McKinsey that says four out of five millennials want to work for a company that has a greater purpose. So whether it is customer engagement, employee mm -hmm. engagement, it's, it's just, a good, just a good thing to do. Good for business. Well, thank you all. I want to ask our audience to thank our panelists for spending their time with us. Mm -hmm.